Thank you. Yeah, I need to include, I need to get whoever's doing announcements and let them know, because I don't think my mom's name is on that list. Katie. Yeah, it's, I just wish I knew how old she was. 80. Is it 80? Are you sure about that? Okay, all right. See, I always have to calculate my, I have to calculate my age. No, I just with my mom.
Scripture in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be with you and every one of you here this morning. Thank you, Handels, for that beautiful prelude. I want to invite you to stand with me if you're able as we join together in our call to worship. We'll follow that up with hymn number 414, God Who Stretched, hymn number 414. But for now, if you respond with what is bold and yellow, we'll join together in worship. Welcome all who long to encounter Jesus, the one who loves, tends, sustains, and saves us. Jesus said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Welcome all who walk the halls of power, who feel pushed and pulled to fight for position, status, and authority. Jesus said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Welcome all who feel burned out, who have given more than they have day in and day out, and long for someone to notice that you too need help and support. Jesus said, the Son of Man may not to be served, but to serve. Welcome followers of Christ, who came to serve and show God's abundant love and grace among us. We worship the one who came not to be served, but to serve, and has given his life a ransom for many. Let us together confess our sin. 
Gracious God, we confess that too often we clamor for attention. Me, me, look at how important I am. That's what our actions say. Like James and John, we pray selfish prayers for power, for position, for prestige, for what? So that people will say how great we are. Teach us that true greatness comes from humble service. Show us how to roll up our sleeves, dig in, and lend a hand, even when no one else will. Preoccupy us with humility, then greatness can come when we least expect it. Give us the grace to live as humble servants. the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Beloved of the Lord, know that Jesus, who came not to be served, but to serve, hears our prayers. And know that the same Jesus forgives us, so be at peace. Thanks. Thanks be to God. God. I invite you at this time to share that peace with the neighbor next to you to pass the peace of Christ. <laughs> Children's message. 
Um, and I know we got at least a couple. Let's uh, let's see who we have here this morning because I got to see if I have enough stuff. But I, I, I'm happy to run short. So come on up. We got two Packer fans. Look at this. Good morning. Good to see you guys. Good morning. Um, you guys know what's right around the corner, right? Yeah. What? Your birthday? Yeah. But other things. The Packers game. <laughs> right, let's get the priorities in order. The Packers game's before your birthday. Yeah. And the Packers on Thursday. Birthday's on Thursday. Packers game's today. Go Packers, right, Mom and Dad? Um, <laughs> just kidding, go Colts also. Um, <laughs> but uh, there's something else that big that's coming up. Like a big, big event. You might have already oh, celebrated Halloween. with Halloween's coming up. You guys gonna go out and do some trick-or-treating? Get some yeah. candy? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. What do you hope for? Like, what do you hope to get when you go out trick or treating? What's? I like, uh, I like crunch bars and I like uh, double bubble bubble gum. Okay, double bubble bubble gum, crunch bars. What do you think? Sour candy. Sour candy. What do you like, huh? What's that? Yes, you can whisper to your brother. You want to be your advocate here. She really, she really likes dum dums and like suckers. Okay, with all of these things, is it the bigger the better? Oh, yeah. Yeah, right? <laughs> it is. It is. I'm hoping for as many king-size crunch bars as I can get. Like king-size is the best, right? The bigger the better, right? The, the, the greater it is, uh, the, the more wonderful it is, which is why I think, I think you're going to be happy with what I have for you this morning. Um, the problem is I got this Nice size Snickers. <laughs> I got this nice size Three Musketeer, and I got this very, very tiny uh, Snickers. So um, I'm gonna let you guys pick here. Um, do you want? Do you want to? Do you want to do like a like a? Do you guys know rock rock scissors? Rock paper scissors? Oh yeah. Okay, let's do rock paper scissors to see who gets to pick first. You ready? These two can go first. These two first. Okay, one, two. Three. Oh, both paper. One, two, three. Oh, then rock. So which one would you like? Okay. All right. So that's between brother and sister. Ready? One, two, three. Oh, paper cover scissors. Oh my gosh. So they're getting the greatest. They got this greatest, and you're going to get this least. The, the littlest. What's that? No, it's not okay. Because in Jesus' world, Sometimes the least is the greatest. And you know how I know that? I know that not just by following Jesus and just how Jesus' life shows this, that when you take the lowest place or you don't go for the greatest thing, but sometimes you take the lowest, whether you choose to or whether you kind of run into it like you just did, is sometimes the least can be the greatest. So I want you to take that little thing, and I don't want you guys to open yours yet, but I want you to open that up. That little Snickers, tiny little Snickers, insignificant in comparison to these other two young gentlemen. You you tear into it, just tear into it. Well, look what's hidden there. What in the world, right? What is that? that $5 bill that was hidden in that. You can buy, well, I went to shop for these yesterday. You can buy those two. It used to be when I was a kid, you could buy a lot more than that. Maybe if you get a deal, you can get three or four of those big ones. But you who took the least are going to end up with the greatest. And that's one way to understand how Jesus, when he says the least is the greatest, sometimes the littlest things, the things that we don't think are important, or taking the lowest place, or serving someone, or doing something very small, ends up having a huge impact, and it's far worth far more than we ever expect. Now we're going to look at a story where Jesus is going to invite us to take the place of servanthood, where we serve others, where we don't always try to rule over others, but we try to help them and love them. And in doing that, Jesus is going to say, that's where true greatness is. Greatness is in being good. It's in serving others. And so you got the greatest, even though it's the least. And in that way, (laughs) it's going to help illustrate what Jesus is going to say to all of us adults and hopefully all of us here later. I'm grateful that you guys came up. Happy birthday. 
Go Pack Go. Let me pray with you before you head back to your seats. God, we are grateful for these children. Bless them and their families. May they know your peace and your presence and your strength. We pray for each person here in this room that we would learn and grow what it means to follow Christ and learn that mystery of how the greatest is the least. And at times, those who take the lowest place have the greatest, greatest reward. So thank you. Bless us. Be with us. Be present with us. Thank you for these children. In the name of Christ, we pray this together. Amen. Thank you, guys. Good to see you this morning. Our early scripture last week encouraged us to think about our priorities, whether they were worldly or heaven-bound. And this week, we're encouraged to think about Jesus' humility and what that meant for his life story. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion or sympathy. Make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. <clears throat> Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. And let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in form of God, did not reward equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God also exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen.
Our gospel reading this morning is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 32 to 45. Um, it is from the lectionary, and I invite you to stand if you're able. As we read this together, as I read it, and you listen in, we'll follow this up with hymn number 117, Fairest Lord Jesus. So hear the word of the Lord. They were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. They were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. He took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, and Mar um, Louise, can you forward the slides for me on this? We don't have Jenny. Thank you. He began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, Look, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit upon him and flog him and kill him. And after three days he will rise again. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What it is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Appoint us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to appoint, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. Instead, whoever wishes to become great among you must first be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Those of you who know me know that that's one of my favorite hymns. I do my best to not overplay it. Uh, but I think when we're reading a passage like the one KC read about the glory of Jesus and how different he is from those who exert power in our world and the call he gives to us and how we connect that into our story where he challenges his followers to not manifest power the way the world appreciates, but instead to seek a different kind of authority, a different kind of power, a greatness that's shown in goodness and not just domineering authority. I think we need to sing songs like that because Jesus is always the model. He's the one inviting us to follow him, which is to be like him. And of course, he's always doing that with his 12 disciples. They, they are following him around and we sometimes picture, I think, that they're a bit too happy of a band, that they are getting along with one another and there's no power plays, that nobody's trying to get one up on the other. But clearly, this story shows us that James and John have been thinking for quite a while about when to ask for positions of prominence and authority in Christ's kingdom, and they are choosing perhaps the most awkward and worst time to do that. They choose to ask Jesus for these places of positions of authority and power, right after Jesus tells them that the job description involves being beaten and betrayed and killed and all of these horrible things. It's almost as if they hear, you know, the business is going under, and then they say, well, we'd like the two top seats in the business. Um, because they aren't getting, they can't understand, they just simply can't fathom what Jesus is about to do, even though he tells them quite plainly again and again. Our story begins with this road to Jerusalem. We're continuing on in Mark's story, and Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, and the twelve are with them, and for the third time in Mark, he warns them about the horrors that are to come. He warns them that what they are approaching is not going to be easy. It's going to involve conflict that they cannot fathom. And yet, once again, they prove that they can't hear this side of the story. They're good with a Messiah that reigns in power and authority over others, dominating them and making them be subservient to Messiah's will. They can't fathom, even though they've walked with Jesus all this time, that greatness might be found in a different way, in a different way than the world manifested, that Jesus might be a different kind of king than the world is used to. They don't fathom that, and so they hear this horror story that we're going and the Son of Man will be handed, condemned to death, handed over to Gentiles, all these horrible things will happen. And it's at this time that James and John decide, let's make our move. Let, let's get to Jesus before the other ten do. And they decide they're going to approach Jesus with a question. And so they come forward in the midst of this merry man, and they say, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you, which is not a good way to start a question. Like, you know, will you do whatever I want you to? Um, what do you want me to do for you? However, Jesus says, okay, what is it you want me to do for you? And I, and I love that. Jesus often asks questions of his disciples, and that's a good question. We ought to ask regularly, what do you want Jesus to do for us? What do you want Jesus to create in our lives? What do we want to be? What kind of people do we want to be? What kind of people do we want to be as followers of Christ? And so Jesus, very quickly, because he is their rabbi, he is their teacher, he says, okay, what is it you want? And they make their request very sternly, very boldly, without any shame whatsoever. We want to be the top dogs in your kingdom. We want to have the seats of honor at the Messianic banquet. We want to share the two thrones on the side of your Messianic kingdom and, and rule right beside you. We want to be your right hand and your left hand man. Now in other stories, they're a little bit more understated and they, they try to get their mom to ask Jesus this. Uh, but Mark doesn't tell it that way. James and John just come flat out and say, we want the highest status. We want to be the greatest. The greatest in your kingdom, we want privilege, recognition, power, and glory. It's an outrageously selfish request, and it's an utterly human request. It's the kind of request we all make. Um, we, we, we don't recognize sometimes the self-interest that's involved, but I know our previous generation would say something like this to James and John, you're getting too big for your bridges, boys. Uh, you, you're overstating your qualifications. Uh, you don't quite understand what's going on here. Um, they don't get it. And what's wonderful about our Lord, and you must understand this about Jesus, is this would be a perfect time for him to condemn them, 
for him to say, why don't you guys get this? Why don't you ever understand? Why aren't you listening to me? Do you understand at all what I just said about what we're approaching and you want to be at my right hand and left hand? Instead, I imagine Jesus with frustration mixed with sadness because he loves these disciples, just like he loved the rich man last week. He, he loves them. And he can't understand why they don't want get this. And so he says with frustration and disappointment, you just don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm going to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm about to be baptized? Do you understand the bitterness and suffering that I'm about to engage in? Do you understand that the crown I'm going to wear is a crown made of thorns, not of gold? And that the throne I will reign from will not be this regal royal thing, but it'll be a torture object that's the cross. Do you understand that those who will be on my right and my left are not people with power? It will be two bandits, two thieves. Do you get this at all? And they don't get it. And as proof that they don't get it, look at their answer. Are you able to drink the cup? We yeah, can. We can do it. You know, just, just unashamedly making it clear that, yeah, we think we can do this. And I can imagine, if you remember the old Star Trek where Spock would raise his eyebrow, like, fascinating. You know, this is curious, that they are doing something, and I imagine Jesus quizzically raising his eyebrow and recognizing that something's been lost in translation, that their understanding of greatness is far too wrapped up, almost inextricably, with the greatness of the world, that the only way they understand power is power as it's demonstrated in the world as they see it. They haven't seen Jesus' new way of power and authority. And he knows that they're not able because in just a few days, they'll be falling asleep while Jesus is trying to pray and they're not able to support him. They'll run off the minute the trouble arises and they'll say, we don't know him. These people who are say they are able, they are far from able. And so Jesus hears that they think they're able and he says, and I think this is important, the cup that I drink, you will drink. Yeah, this will come your way eventually, and the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. You will enter into this way of life eventually. But to sit at my right hand and my left hand is not for me to appoint. It's for those for whom it's prepared. In other words, they will get the point eventually, and I think that's Jesus' hope, that they're going to get it. They're going to understand this eventually. And that's where the story ends with James and John, because at this point, the ten, this merry band, the ten hear of their request, and they howl in protest. They can't believe that James and John have beat them too much. They're howling in protest, not because James and John are asserting their kind of authority in such a way that they're trying to elevate themselves above others. They howl in protest because I think they forgot that they should have done this first. They should have been first to come and say, I want to be at the right hand. Peter, anyone had the right to say, hey, you're the one who appointed me like the head apostle, so I should be the one at your right hand. And I think that they feel depleted in the sense that they've been beaten to the punch and we see the skirmishings for power in the midst of these disciples. And of course, this has to trouble Jesus to no end, which is why he makes this moment a teachable moment. Jesus does this all the time. Just a normal event, this crazy request for power, the disciples being angry, you can see the conflict and the turmoil among the disciples, and Jesus pretty much slows things down and says, let's have a teachable moment here. Let me tell you something that might help all of you to get a grip on what's actually going on here. So he calls them together. Teachable moment, guys. You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. You know that the way the world works, the one with authority is served by others. The one with authority exerts their power over others. The one with authority is able to force and intimidate and demand loyalty and make sure that those who are being lorded over truly serve the rightful Lord. You know that that's how the world works. Power and greatness in the world has to do with exerting your will over others, making them do what you want them to do. That's greatness according to the world. But he says, it is not so among you. That's not how it's supposed to be among my followers. Instead, whoever wishes to be great must first be the servant. And whoever wishes to be first must be the servant of all. There's a greatness that Jesus is speaking of that is so different 
than the understanding that we have of power and of lording over other people. There is a sense in which he says, you know, if you want to know what greatness is, greatness is least. It's taking the lowest place. It is serving. It is using your power for the welfare and the good of others. It's not using your power so that others will serve you. It's using your power so you may serve others. And as the basis for this, you see the lesson. That's the lesson in a nutshell. This is summarized, so Jesus probably expanded on all of this. But his chief example of why this is to be the case, why the disciples are not to rule in the way the world does, is for I, the Son of Man, came not to be served, but to serve. I, the Lord of glory. I, the one who comes from the Father. I, the one who possess all authority, have come. And the way I've shown that power and shown that authority is by serving. And I will show it to the full extent by giving my life over for the ransom of many. I will give myself sacrificially and lovingly. And all of a sudden you realize Jesus has this new understanding of power. He doesn't disparage the importance of power. Greatness and power are important. But he redefines it so that we understand that greatness is not lording over others. It's not jockeying for positions. Instead, it is found in selfless service and taking the lowest place and renouncing all rights because that's what a slave did. They had no rights of their own. Their only job was to serve and to help and to uh, please others. So Jesus tells them, James, John, and all the other ten, you're all misguided. You all have got it wrong. Your view of greatness is far too human. It's shaped far too much by the world instead of Christ's kingdom. And there must be a rethinking of how power is expressed. There must be a rethinking of what true greatness is. And there's no better picture, of course, than Jesus. And if we see him in action, we realize that he has great power. He has great authority. But the way he uses it is not as those who have great power and authority in this world. Paul, in the reading that Casey provided for us from Philippians 2, goes out of his way to show how this model that Jesus gives us is meant to inform not just James and John, not just the other ten, but it's something for all of us. When he says, you know, if you have any comfort in Christ, if you have any partnership in the Spirit, if you have any heart within you at all, make my joy complete. Have the same mind and same love with one another. Don't do anything from selfish ambition or empty conceit. In humility, regard others and better than yourselves. Which sounds like some good moral teaching until you realize he's actually referring to Jesus as he moves on in his text. Don't look out to your own interests. Let the same mind or the attitude be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he existed in the highest place. He had the greatest authority. There's none greater. He did not see his greatness as something that was to be used over others. He did not see his greatness as something that would allow him to dominate. Instead, he emptied himself and took the form of a servant, assuming human likeness. And being found in appearance, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, the most shameful death in that day and age that one could imagine. And we might look at that and say, oh, he's a loser. He's a loser. He has no power. He's weak. He, he gets nothing done. He dies this shameless death on the cross as, as a tortured and, and ruined criminal, shamed, in no way showing the power of Messiah. But God's evaluation of this act is God highly exalted in. That's the whole point of the resurrection. That from the world's standpoint, it looks like Jesus has failed miserably in his crucifixion. That the world has rejected him and his power is weakness. But God evaluates it and exalts Jesus, gives him the name that is above every other name, so that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bend. This one who shows this power in service, who shows his greatness through his goodness, is exalted to the highest place. And God says, that's my boy. That's what it means to rule in my kingdom. That's what it means to show authority and power in the kingdom of God that is to be established. And all of a sudden we realize, wow, this is our model. The way of glory, the way of power, is through self-giving and self, uh, self-giving love. And it demands that we rethink greatness. We just have to rethink greatness. We need to be careful of who we call losers. We need to be careful of who we call great. Uh, we need to be very wary that the 
it's the definition for both of those things is so different in light of the greatest is the least and the least is the greatest. And of course, we all have trouble doing it. It's not like I'm preaching at you. I'm preaching at me too, because we're all the stumbling disciples. We're all the ones that hear Jesus tell us exactly what needs to be done. And we just lose it in interpretation. We just conveniently either discard it or dismiss it or don't understand it or can't fathom how it could be true in the world in which we live. And so we just kind of say, well, uh, give us anything we want. Here's what I want. Not understanding what Jesus actually wants for us. The disciples here, they believe he's Messiah. They, they believe that he's the one. And yet they don't understand that that one is showing his authority in a way that they're also supposed to follow. And it's not about having the glory of thrones and ruling over others. It's about serving others in the way that Christ served. They want, like we want, the greatness of authority, but not the goodness of serving. They want a crown without a cross. They want glory without giving. And it reminds me, for me, this is just me, you all know me. The saddest song in all of Jesus Christ Superstar is when Jesus is speaking to Simon the Zealot, who wants Jesus to use his power like the positions in Rome and like those who abuse their power in order to get the people to follow him. Just do one thing that uses violence or uses manipulation or dominates in order that the people might be inspired to follow. And Jesus hears Simon the Zealot, and it might as well be James or John. And the music stops and it's quiet. And Jesus says, neither you, Simon, nor the 50,000, nor the Romans, nor the Jews, nor Judas, nor the 12, nor the priests, nor the scribes, nor doom Jerusalem itself. None of you understand what power is. None of you understand what glory is. None of you understand it all. And then you have this sad song where he says, if you knew, and he talks about his death to come, very much like our scripture reading before us. And it is this sad time when you see the loneliness of Jesus and that he's trying to get them to see something, but they just can't see it. And it's not because they're bad. It's because their eyes are blinded by the power of the world and by the way things are done. And they think God's leader and Lord ought to be pretty much like the lords of this world, but maybe just a hair better, maybe not quite as bad. Where instead Jesus comes a totally different kind of king, the king who serves, the king who says, take the least place, the king who gives his life. And all of a sudden we're dealing in rarefied air of how greatness has to be redefined for all of us. The good thing about this passage is they're going to drink the cup. Just as we will drink the cup, eventually we learn this lesson. Eventually we follow and understand, yes, this is what power and authority and glory looks like. It comes by means of service and of humility and of emptying oneself, that following Jesus is the way. And when we get to that point, we realize, well, moving from great to good is a Jesus way of doing things. And all of us are capable of doing it. The only quote I have this morning, and I'm just about done, Martin Luther King Jr. in a beautiful sermon said this about the servanthood of all believers. Because you all will drink the cup. I will drink the cup. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You don't have to know Plato and Aristotle. You don't have to know Einstein's theory of relativity. You don't have to know the second theory of thermodynamics and physics. You only need a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love. And in that, Martin Luther King, rooted in his Baptist tradition, was trying to talk about the servanthood of all believers. That there's no one that's incapable. That, that, that we're all qualified, it's just, are we willing? Will we drink the cup? And of course, Jesus says all of his followers will drink the cup and will move from great to good. And with Jesus as our model, our standard for goodness, the question at the heart of the sermon really is Jesus' question to James and John. What do you want me to do for you? Do you want me to help you move from great to good? Do you want me to help you move from pride to humility? Do you want me to help you move from me first to others matter? Do you want that? What do you want me to do for you? Because that's what I'll do for you. But giving you a seat in my right hand and left hand without going through the process of servanthood, I won't give because you don't deserve those seats. You're not prepared yet. But you can be prepared. So what do you want me to do for you? Do you want me to move you from your idea of greatness to the Messiah's idea of goodness? We have just a moment of quiet reflection and then we'll have a prayer and response.
as usual, I usually have a prayer response that I put together that tries to connect us to the story we've just heard, inviting God to do the things in our life that we've read about. If you feel comfortable praying this along with me, I invite you to join me in this. If not, I invite you to listen prayerfully. Lord Jesus Christ, though you existed in the form of God, with all the influence and status that the name implies, you refused to pull rank and parade your power upon us. Instead, you chose to step down into our experience, living among us as one of us, with all the struggle and suffering that goes with being human. More than that, you adopted the role of servant, washing feet, serving people of no reputation or social standing, and giving of yourself completely. As incredible as it sounds, you are a God who serves, and we can respond in no other way than to give ourselves to you in grace. And so we pray for forgiveness this day, for choosing power over service, forgive us, for seeking glory rather than humility, forgive us, for pushing ourselves to the front when our presence is needed on the sidelines, forgive us. Help us know where we are needed and how best to serve you and your people. Guide us to your side that we might remember that true greatness is nothing less than love and nothing more than servitude. In the name of the Master who serves us best, Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. And now as we intercede on behalf of this world, we pray for peace and justice to reign, particularly in areas of war and strife. We pray for uh, healing and help and hope in places torn and worn by natural disasters. We pray for your spirit to comfort in those who mourn and suffer in our community. We think particularly of Mona and of Rachel and of Dave, asking for your strength, your peace, your grace, your love to be present with them. We pray for the family of the Seidens and for the Lindstrom family. In light of recent loss, we pray for your strength and your support and your grace as well. Help us to know how best we can serve these loved ones in our community. And then we think of names of people in our own lives, in our own communities, our own friends, co-workers. We lift these names and we ask, oh God, be present with them. May they know your strength. May they know your peace. Be the God who serves them and help us to know how best to serve as well. Finally, we thank you for the gifts given in the giving church and pray you bless the gift and the giver as together we pray boldly with all the saints which you are risen and have taught us. Praying together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Our final song is a great song about humble service. Hymn number 369, Lord's Love and Humble Service. I invite you, once you've found that, to stand if you're able and we'll join together as our final song.
presence here this morning. Go in peace. May the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the blessed fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you now and forevermore. Amen.